Thank you very much. And it's always a pleasure to be able to share with you, and I want to welcome you that are here this morning in person and those online. Well, I guess it's official. We're in the Christmas season. I always say when Thanksgiving hits, at least for me, it's moving into the Christmas holidays. And I love this time of the year. The reason I do is because I love being with friends and family. I love decorations. I love all the trees and the lights and the colors and everything else. I love watching my grandkids get excited over gifts and just playing with them and them coming over. I don't like the stressfulness. I don't like the busyness. But I love the season. But I especially love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to me has always been a special holiday because at Thanksgiving, hopefully, it refocuses us on the blessings that we have. Hopefully, it focuses, refocuses us on giving thanks to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I want to talk about Thanksgiving, not necessarily the holiday, although I will include that. But I want to talk to you today about the importance of giving thanks. Because I have found in my Christian walk that probably one of the um, greatest weapon I have to fight against things that attack me, such as sadness and depression and anxiety and all those things, is to be thankful and to have a good attitude. And that's not, some, amen, that's not something easy to do. And so I, I thank God for Thanksgiving. You know, Americans look forward to Thanksgiving. I think today Americans look forward to it because they can eat so much and um, watch the football, go Bills, you know. Hey, come on. But um, the truth of the matter is, it was a holiday established about 400 years ago. And we all know the story. We've heard it at school too many times, and people told us. But you had the pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower, and they wanted to find religious freedom. They were tired of where they lived. They couldn't worship God freely. They came over to America to make a new start. Unfortunately, those on the Mayflower were supposed to land in Virginia. They got off course, ended up in um, Plymouth Rock and Plymouth, Massachusetts. And, of course, we know the story that it was a horrible winter. Many people died. They were lacked food. They had no shelter. It was very horrible. In fact, the governor, um, William Bradford, describes the winter like this. He says, that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time, half of the company had died. Half the people that went died. Can you imagine getting on a ship thinking, wow, we are going to a land and such opportunity and such um, a place where we can worship freely and they're all excited and they get here and because of disease and sickness and the horrible storms and not having shelter and running out of food, half of them die. In fact, it got even more discouraging because a ship came to bring them provisions, to bring them relief, and there was no provisions on the ship, only 35 more people and 35 more mouths to feed. And it was tough. But by God's grace, they made it through. And that spring, they were able to plant many seeds, thank goodness for the American Indians that became their friends and came alongside them. And they were able to have a great harvest in the fall. And they celebrated the first Thanksgiving in 1621. And it was described as a time of just gratefulness and thankfulness to God for the plenty that they had. They were overwhelmed how God had blessed them with such plent plentiful stuff. And there's a great scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, that says this. Be thankful in all circumstances. Now, I want you to hear me. In all circumstances. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ. Be thankful in all circumstances? Really? This is your will for me who is in Christ Jesus? Let's just be honest. It is difficult to be thankful all the time. Many of you here today are facing such grief, such sorrow. We just lost a dear brother from our, our church. It was just great sorrow grabs hold of us. How could this happen, God? 
Why did you allow someone so young to die? Such pain, knowing people with sicknesses and diseases. The list goes on and on. But yet it says to be thankful in all things. Listen, listen to this um, the, out of the message, the Bible contemporary language. This is the same verse. Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. Really, God? Are you kidding? But this is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. That's powerful. Why do you think it was so powerful to give thanks to God in all circumstances? I'm going to tell you why. Because like I said, I believe it's a powerful tool in the hands of God's children because something supernaturally happens when we're in the midst of crisis, when we can lift our eyes to him and begin to thank him in the midst of horribleness. Come on. Something supernatural happens. Whether you experience depression, anxiety, sadness, great grief, as many of you I know are walking through, or maybe you've been defeated, or you're overstressed, or you're dealing with disbelief, or disillusionment, or you've been praying for so long for that prodigal, and the prodigal has not come back yet, and you're saying, God, do we even hear my prayer? Come on. We go through difficult times in this world. There's just no getting around it. I don't understand it. I can't tell you why it happens. But I do know that I am God's child. He is in control. And his word says to me, give thanks in all things. Now, that's not easy. That's a very difficult thing to do. But let, let me tell you this. It doesn't say give thanks for all things. Uh, hear me. It doesn't mean I, Jonathan hurt, Pastor Jonathan hurts his hand. Thank you, Jesus, that my hand hurts and I can't use it and I'm in so much pain. No. Be thankful in all things. You see, God allows things to happen in our life because even as Pastor Jonathan spoke last week, he's building something within us, some type of character within our spirits. I taught out of Psalm 84 two weeks ago. And there was a great scripture that I love in Psalm 84. And it says, as the people pass through the valley of weeping. See, they were going through a horrible time. But it says they made it a spring. How do you make what you are walking through into a spring of refreshment? By looking to him. By thanking him. By praising him. Come on. That's, that, that's the, that is a supernatural key for each one of us as we walk through life. Because let's be honest, we live in a world that is decaying, in a world where we're going to see crisis after crisis after crisis, and it's going to affect us. There's no way of getting around it. But God said, be thankful in all circumstances, no matter what it is that you're going through. And I loved in Psalm 84, it says right after that, as they make it a spring, they go from strength to strength, increasing in victorious power. Come on. You see, something supernatural happens to us when we're facing a crisis. Now, do we cry? Yes. Do we get sad? Yes. Do we, uh, do we get mad? Yeah, I do. Come on, we're human beings. But in the end, God says, look to me and begin to give thanks unto me because I am with you and I will work in your life. And you know what happens? We begin to get strength to go through. And the next time we get the strength to go through. And the next thing we know, we have this unbelievable, victorious power to overcome that which we're facing. God wants to do that in each and every one of your lives. And so we need to learn to cultivate a heart of thanksgiving. Now, that word cultivate is interesting. I looked it up, and one definition I saw said to improve by labor. When you cultivate the ground, it takes a lot of work, doesn't it? You know, I, I remember when we moved, first moved to Clarence years ago, and we wanted to have a garden in our backyard, and it, the soil was as hard as a rock. And it took so long to cultivate that ground, to break it up, 
to make it uh, work so we can plant seeds to put food, uh, 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 um, fertilizer in the soil to make it soft. And it took a lot of work. But it's the same thing with us. We have to cultivate Thanksgiving in our lives. It's something we have to choose to do. And, and God is calling us today to be a people of Thanksgiving. In fact, let me tell you this. The Bible actually promises something to us if we can have thankful hearts. And I didn't write this on the PowerPoint, but in Philippians 4, 7, it says, let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And what does it say then? It says, then the peace of God, a peace that, that transcends all of our understanding. We don't get it. We don't understand it. It's a peace that gives us hope and assures our heart. That peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Giving thanks is a powerful, powerful tool that God has given us. And I, I got to tell you, this world doesn't offer a lot of joy. Our joy cannot be based on how we feel in the circumstances around us. Because you know as well as I do, tomorrow morning you may wake up with aches and pains and feeling disgusting and think, oh man, I just don't want to do anything. Or the world around you is collapsing in some way or another. Our joy does not depend on that. Our joy depends on the Lord. I am, um, as I was preparing for this, I came across, of course, um, you all know her, Corey Ten Boone. She wrote The Hiding Place, and her, her and her sister were Christians who hid the Jews during the um, Holocaust and during the time of the Nazi rule. And uh, they were caught. They were thrown in a concentration camp, and uh, they faced uh, terrible, terrible atrocities. It was horrible. But there was one thing that I was reading about thankfulness, and uh, she, Corey went on to say that they were forced to disrobe before the German soldiers. And she said it was just the most humiliating, horrible experience. And as she was just having such a difficult time, the Lord put this thought in her mind. And she said, they took Jesus close too, and he hung naked for me. And she just began to be overwhelmed and touched. And she went to her sister, Betsy, and she said, Betsy, Betsy, I got to tell you something. What God just showed me, that they took Jesus' clothes too, and he hung naked for me and for you. And Betsy's response was this, oh, Corey, I never thanked him for that. And she began to thank God. You see, even in the most horrible of situation, Corey and Betsy Temboom found something to thank God. And he gave them the grace and the strength to get through it. Listen, they were powerful men, a powerful woman of God. Why is that? Because I believe they lived a life to choose to see life from God's perspective. That's what they did. And I want to share with you some kernels of Thanksgiving. And you may say, well, what, what, why are you using the word kernels? Let me tell you why. I read this little legend. It's, it's uh, a myth, a legend, they, they think. But someone wrote it, and I thought it was kind of a great idea. And um, on Thanksgiving, when things, well, before Thanksgiving, when the pilgrims had very little to eat, it was said that sometimes and some days, they only were allowed to have five kernels of corn for the day. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But the truth of the matter was, many of them were starving to death. And so when they celebrated the first Thanksgiving, they said that the pilgrims laid out five kernels of corn on each one of their plates to remind them of the blessings that they had. And then, of course, the article went on to say that from every Thanksgiving after that, they always laid out these five kernels of corn to thank God and remind them where they came from. And today I want to share with you five kernels of thankfulness from Psalm 103. Because these things that we can all be thankful for no matter what we're going through. You see, sometimes we're in a horrible situation and we think to ourselves, I have nothing to be thankful for. I mean, come on, God, what do I have to be thankful for? I have lost this. I'm suffering this. And I can't do this anymore. My body's hurting so bad I can't do this. We don't have the money. Oh, great. Christmas is coming. I have no money. I can't, I can't give gifts. I can't do this. You know, we could go on and on with our problems. 
But I want to give you five things today out of Psalm 103 that each and every one of us can be thankful for. You ready? Let's read Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that he has done for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. He redeems, my, uh, redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies or compassion. He fills my life with good things, and my youth is renewed like the eagles. Kernel number one, the kernel of forgiveness. Something we can all thank God for if we are his children. He has forgiven us of all our sins. That tells us in the first part of verse 3. He forgives all my sins. Why did Jesus come to earth in the first place? I believe he came to earth because he wanted to restore mankind to a state of fellowship that they used to have before the fall. What do I mean by that? When God created man and woman, Adam and Eve, his intentions were to create people in his image that those people could have constant fellowship with him. And he put them in a perfect place. The Garden of Eden was perfect. I have to believe there was no bugs. They were biting all over you. There was unity. There was peace. There was joy. There was no sickness. They, the Bible even says they walked with God. Okay, they had this perfect fellowship with their creator. Everything was wonderful. And then man took things into their own hands. See, God didn't make men and women robots. He made them in his image, that they had a free choice, that they can make their own decisions, because he wanted them to love him for who he was. And he wanted this fellowship. And so man sins. And right after they sin, just imagine that. They are taken out of that perfect, perfect environment. And now they are thrown into this world where they have to work hard, where they suffer pain, where there's disunity in the family. I mean, come on, that one son kills another son. They, they, now they're dealing with sin, iniquity, and the worst of all, God didn't walk with them every day in the fellowship in that personal contact that they had with them. Because sin now separated them from that. And so God said, I can't have this. There's no way. I want fellowship. I love my people. So we sent the Lord Jesus Christ. And he came down to earth as man. He was God in the flesh. And he died and upon the t tree. He took the beatings for you and I. Then he took every sin that we've ever committed, the sins that we're going to commit, and he took it upon himself so that you and I could be forgiven and cleansed and made righteous and once again have fellowship with our King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what Jesus did for us. That's the God we serve. Listen to these verses, Hebrews 9, 14. For by the power of, eternal, of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. Yet he did it for you and he did it for me that we could have fellowship and eternal life with him. Verse 15, for Christ died to set us free from the penalty of sins. Do you understand what we deserve because of sin? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. That's our sin nature. But yet Jesus came to cleanse us and wipe those sins away. Verse Hebrews 9, 28 says, So also Christ was offered once and for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. If you're here today, and you have accepted Christ in your heart, and you have asked Jesus and God to forgive you for those things that you have done. Listen, he has cleansed you. He has wiped away your sins. <clears throat> no longer do you have to walk in shame, in guilt, and in condemnation, because Jesus has set you free from that. And you know, as I was doing this, I was thinking that, <clears throat> and the thought came to me that some are still here struggling with accusatory thoughts. <coughs> Thoughts like, I can never be forgiven. Look what I did. Look at the life I did. And then you sin again and you fall into temptation. You think, 
God will never love me. God will never forgive me. No, that is not true. Because Jesus came once and for all. And all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. And he will cleanse you. And he will take away guilt, shame, and condemnation. Listen to Psalm 103.10. This is a little later down in the psalm. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. Our sins, we deserve punishment. We deserve death. Never to be with God again. But God took care of that by sending his son, Jesus. Verse 12 says this, He has removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. How far is the east from the west? Okay? You can't measure it. That's how when we ask him to forgive us, he cleanses us, he forgets it, and he removes it from our lives. He doesn't see you today as this sinner sitting here. He sees you today as cleansed and righteous, just like Adam and Eve started out. And he sees you as wonderful, having fellowship with you. <coughs> All you need to do is Acts 3.19 says, Now repent of your sins and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away. If you're here today, and you never repented of your sins, and you want them wiped away, all you got to say is, Jesus, I'm sorry. I turn to you and I ask you to forgive me. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our, our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now listen to verse 20. When we do that, then times of refreshment will come from the presence of of the Lord. Oh my, how we need those times of refreshment. How we need to be refreshed. All we need to do is be thankful. Thank you, Jesus, for cleansing us and removing these sins from us. That's, that's the first thing we can be thankful. Everyone can be thankful for that if you're a child of God. Number two, to thank the kernel of healing. All right? He forgives us. He heals us. That's what it says in verse three. He heals all my diseases. See, the Bible is clear that Jesus just didn't come to forgive us of our sins, to take away our shame and our guilt and our condemnation, but he also came to heal us. Listen to the prophetic word in Isaiah 53, that the book of Isaiah, he prophesied, this is about Jesus. He said, surely he has borne our griefs or our sicknesses, our weaknesses, our distresses. Come on, he bore them on the cross. Do you feel weak today? Is there addictions that you just can't get past? Do you have sorrow and do you have griefs and sicknesses? It goes on to say he carried our sorrows and our pains of punishment. The punishment that we deserve, he carried it to the cross. And with his, the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and we are made whole. Jesus came to heal us. And he came to heal us, not just physically, but spiritually. A lot of us spiritually need a healing touch from God. We need to be released from the guilt of shame and sin. We need to be uh, filled again with his spirit and alive. And our, sp you know, our, our spirit, it's a spirit part of us. God wants to heal us. He wants us to have complete fellowship with him again. So when we talk about healing, we're not just talking about physical. We're talking about spiritual. I'm talking about emotional. The grief, the sorrows, the hurts, the pains, the anger. People who hurt us. Come on, the list goes on and on and on. He wants to heal you today. He wants to heal you physically. I believe that with all my heart. Why do some people get healed? I don't know. And some don't. I will never know. And someday God will tell us. But all I know he he's, loves us, and he has a plan for all of our lives. And he is accomplishing something in everybody's lives. <clears throat> but this is what I want you to do today. If you are dealing with something, we have prayer people up here or someplace over there, over there, after the service. I want to encourage you to go up for prayer. I want to encourage you to take that step of faith today. Listen with James 5. Uh, 14 says, 
Is any one among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith. Come on, this is what will happen when you come up for these anointed people of God that we have called. They, they, they have a call in their lives to pray. They have the faith to believe. It says, when you, um, excuse me, and the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Amen. Colonel number three, the colonel of redemption. Verse four, he redeems my life from death. Now, <clears throat> when I was doing this, I thought, well, what's the difference between forgiveness and, and redemption? Well, here's the definition of redemption or redeem. The action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil. The action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. In other words, he forgave us of our sin, and now we have regained we fellowship with him. We have regained life. We are redeemed from death. See, we can walk on this earth with constant fellowship with God. But someday, when we take our last breath here on earth, we're going to be ushered right into his presence. You're going to take your last breath, and you're just going to be shoop, ushered right into the presence of God. You have been redeemed from death. It says in Colossians 1, 13, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, and he's brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. When we come to know Christ, when we ask for forgiveness, what he does now is he redeems us from the kingdom of darkness. This world is the kingdom of darkness, Without Christ, God is light. Someday when the sun is gone and the world is gone, the only light is going to be God. And when we come to know him, he redeems us from the kingdom of darkness. He translates us into the kingdom of light. And that's where we walk now. We are redeemed from death. We have complete fellowship with our God and our Savior. Number four, the kernel of love and compassion. Or one, for, uh, one says uh, tender mercies. In verse 12, it says, The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Let me tell you what compassion is. Compassion is feeling, having a feeling of deep sympathy or sorrow for another who is stricken by misfortune. In other words, when you have compassion for someone, you have such a deep sorrow when you see someone else who is hurting. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say it is accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. See, we have compassion on people. We see people and we say, oh, I feel so sorry for them. We have this compassion. But if we do nothing to alleviate their, their condition, that's not complete true compassion but God has compassion and love for his people and I just got to say to you today that God sees what you're going through he sees your stricken state he sees how difficult things have been in certain areas he has not forgotten you he sees it and he wants to help alleviate some of that sadness, some of that grief, some of that hurt that you're going through. How do that happen? As we turn our eyes to him. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, and we begin to thank him for his goodness. God is love. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 13, just for your notes, it says, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and exchange their sorrow for rejoicing. That's what he wants to do for us people in the midst of whatever you're walking through. And the last one, the kernel of blessing. Verse 5. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. I loved him when we were singing, Nikki. That was a great song. Your goodness is running after, running after me. His goodness is running after us. I will sing of the goodness of the Lord. That's what it's all about. Um, Philippians 4.19 says this. You can be sure that God will take care of everything you need. His generosity exceeding even yours in the glory that pours forth from God. 
He wants to give you everything you need to get through this life. And here, here's the thing. When we talk that God wants to bless us, everybody thinks in terms of things and money. That, that, that isn't really exactly all, all the time what that means. It's not that God doesn't want to bless us financially or, or physical things. But what God wants to bless us with is spiritual health, spiritual and emotional health and physical health. That's, that's his blessings. Listen to Ephesians 3, 20 out of the Phillips translation. Now to him who by his power within us, it's within you, is able to do far more than we can ever dare to ask or imagine. You may go, be going through a rough time today, and it may be very difficult for you, but God has called us to give thanks to him. Ephesians 1, 3 says, I'll praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. You know what spiritual blessings are? I just talked about them. Forgiveness, redemption, his love and compassion, his peace in the midst of trials and tribulation. I'm going to ask the band to come up as I close. But you may be sitting here today, you might say to yourself, well, how do I access all that? I don't get it. And I just want to say to you, it's, it's really in some ways so simple. It's hard, but it's simple. It's coming to that place to say, I'm a sinner, Lord. Would you please forgive me? I want you to rule and reign in my life and just surrendering to him. That's what it's about. In this season, as we walk through in this Christmas season now, we're called to be thankful in all circumstances. That's his will for our life. And I want to encourage you. You may be here and saying, I have nothing to be thankful for. Let me tell you, if you're a child of God, you can thank him for his forgiveness, for his healing, for his redemption, for his love and compassion, and for the blessings that he has bestowed upon you. Amen? Let me just close with this scripture in Hebrews 13, 15. It says, through him, therefore, come on, this is, he's talking to us. Through him, therefore, let us at all times offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. Praise is hard to give God when you're going through rough times. And it is a sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice that we offer to God. Listen to what it says. Which is the fruit of lips that thankfully acknowledge, confesses, and glorifies his name. Come on. That has got to be you, and that has got to be me this season. Here's what we're going to do. Before we sing, I want everyone to stand at their feet. And I, I saw you sit down. You got to stand up again. Get you a little exercise here. I want you to begin to thank God. Now listen. It says to thank him with your lips. That means you got to do it out loud. And for some of you, that might be difficult. You're not used to doing that. But I'm going to begin to thank him. And I want you, where you are, just to begin to lift up your voice and begin to thank him for the blessings that he has bestowed upon us as his children. So come on, just begin to lift up your voice. Father, we just thank you today. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that you shed your blood, Jesus, for us, that we are cleansed, that we are made whole. Lord God, we thank you for your redemption. We are redeemed from the curse of death. Lord, we thank you, God, that you have cleansed us and you have redeemed us. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your healing, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you want to heal us, body, soul, and spirit. Lord, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Come on, let's thank him. Thank you, Jesus. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.